Coming up on DTNS, Wi-Fi 7 promises to be better than wired. USB 4 hopes to end cable confusion and using Minecraft as AI kindergarten. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the Finnish countryside, I'm Patrick Beja. And I'm the show's producer and sweltering in Southern California, Roger Chang. We were just having a wonderful conversation about Bonnie Tyler's The Best, as well as whether artificial meat is bad, good, or indifferent on patreon.com slash DTNS's Good Day Internet. You can find it there. Go subscribe. Get part of the wider conversation. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Huawei announced on Twitter it will unveil the upcoming Mate 30 on September 19th in Munich, Germany. Huawei is currently in its second 90-day reprieve from the U.S. government's export ban, which, if it keeps going, would mean that Google can't certify new Android phones, which also means that no Google apps would be on the Mate 30. Huawei hasn't said whether or not it plans to launch the Mate 30 with some other form of Android or possibly with its own Harmony or Hongmeng OS. Nintendo announced a Nintendo Direct live stream set for Wednesday, September 4th, focusing on Switch games still to come this year, including two notable titles, Luigi's Mansion 3 and Pokemon Sword and Pokemon Shield. Nintendo says the presentation will last about 40 minutes and will be available on its YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter channels at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time. Facebook face recognition notifies you if somebody uploads a picture of you anywhere on Facebook. And starting now, that setting will be turned off by default for all users. Uh, they're rolling out that setting right now. So once the new setting is rolled out to your account, you'll see a notification in your news feed. And if you want to get notifications of when your face is uploaded, you'll have to agree to let Facebook scan your face. Android Q, which is officially Android 10 and not Android quite sugary, <laughs> get it, is really out to Pixel phones now with updates to other phones following soon. Android 10 adds gesture navigation, dark mode, and action buttons on the notification panel. It also includes Google Play system update, which handles OS updates for components like OpenGL without needing a full system update. Android 10 also has a new option to give an app location info only if it's in the foreground. Now, uh, we, we have lots of Wi-Fi and, and USB spec stuff that's going to really impact your life, and it's good to talk about. But let's start with something that probably won't impact your life, <laughs> foldable phones. Or won't it? Because the nightmare, it? the global nightmare that we've all been living in <laughs> is almost over. Indeed, <clears throat> after five months, Samsung is once again letting customers pre-register to purchase the Samsung Galaxy Fold, which Samsung believes will launch later this month, presumably at the 1980 American dollars price point it previously announced. Pre-registering does not require any money. At the same time, Bloomberg reports that it has sources that say Samsung has a different foldable phone in the works, for next year, the Samsung Galaxy Fold is a 7.3-inch tablet that folds into a phone form factor, but the new foldable that Bloomberg says is in the works would be a 6.7-inch phone form factor that would fold into a square like a flip phone. It supposedly uses bendable glass, where the Galaxy Fold uses bendable plastic. Bloomberg, Bloomberg sources say Samsung has entered a partnership with Thorne Brown on the looks, and Lenovo is working on what sounds like it might be a similar foldable razor. So we are going to get foldable, more foldable phones. Although it'll be interesting to see if the Galaxy Fold A gets anybody to buy it, B, if it passes the reviews, and C, if it doesn't do that well, whether Samsung continues to push a foldable phone. Because to be honest, the 6.7-inch fo phone that folds up and is pretty thin, which is what Bloomberg is saying, uh, sounds like a more reasonable option for people, especially if it's not 1980 bucks. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems with my uh, my my iPhone Plus Max Pro, whatever it's going to be called in a week, <laughs> uh, is that it. I like the screen size, but there are like tiny little purses or just little pockets that it doesn't mm -hmm. fit into. So if it, if 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 I had an option to, this is the exact same device, but in transit it is smaller, or perhaps the rear-facing cameras now are on the front 
given whatever situation I might be in. That's really cool. Yeah, I think the current generation of foldable phones, of which there are a few, whether or not they do well doesn't really mean much for the future of foldables. Um, the next generation, or maybe even the one after that, might be the one that decides it. Now it's really just beta, not even beta. It's like pre-alpha production uh, devices. Yeah, I think it's unlikely that that some kind of new form factor, like what the Samsung Galaxy Fold is attempting to do, or the Mate foldable Mate is attempting to do, really ends up taking off. But just more practical things like flip phones. We we know flip phones were a usable form factor for a long time. So if you can have a touch screen and a flip phone, yeah, maybe I could see that working better. CNET's Stephen Shanklin reports on the state of development of Wi-Fi 6 and eventually Wi-Fi 7 expected to arrive in 2024. At Qualcomm's Wi-Fi Day back in August, VP of Technology VK Jones said that Wi-Fi 6's first improvement will be more capacity if U.S. and European governments open up radio transmission in the 6 gigahertz bands. That may happen next year. Then an update to Wi-Fi 6 in 2022 should do that for upload speeds, should do for upload speeds what Wi-Fi 6 already does for download thanks to ULMU MIMO. And then upgrades to come in 2024 as part of 802.11BE or Wi-Fi 7 would round out the changes. That would have something called coordinated multi-user MIMO or CMU MIMO, which if it works, could use antennas from multiple devices together to get more out of the spectrum. Good way to take advantage of mesh network systems. Wi-Fi 7 could also be able to send data on multiple frequencies at the same time, like 2.5 and 5 gigahertz simultaneously, for instance. And 4096 QAM could squeeze more information into the radio signal itself. Yeah, so uh, well, we did a special on Wi-Fi 6 not too long ago. Uh, if you listen to that, you know that one of the big advantages to Wi-Fi 6 is it can handle multiple devices at once. Uh, so it, it, it's it got the MU MIMO, the MU MIMO, but that is tuned for download. And so the UL MU MIMO that, that Sarah just mentioned would be uh, coming in 2022 would allow for better uploads and you could do streaming over wireless. And that's when people start to talk about like, at some point Wi-Fi is going to be as good, if not better than wired as far as latency and performance. And then of course, Wi-Fi 7, you know, that's that's not coming for five more years, but uh, they're, they're, they're working on it. And if they get it working as well as they hope, uh, would surpass wired in its ability to, to transmit data, you know, 30 gigabits per second. You can do 1.3 gigabits per second with Wi-Fi 6 right now, I think. I think I have that right. Uh, it's certainly less than two. So 30 coming over Wi-Fi, that, uh, that, that's a whole new world. Oh, I love the idea of Wi-Fi bypassing <laughs> wired, you know? The I mean, paperless office becomes the wireless office. Oh. I don't know. I'm halfway there already. But yeah, I mean, this is I I I also like the 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 being able to not have to choose between 2.5 and 5 gigahertz, which are both good for different reasons. Five gigahertz kind of works for me the most, but there are certain uh, instances where I switch back and forth. Uh and yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting that Wi-Fi 7 isn't the official name, but I don't see why they wouldn't call it that. They've been working up oh, it will numerically be. in increments for yeah. some time now. I, I, I mean, wireless will always be a little bit more susceptible to uh, issues in the in the spectrum, uh, less in your house than weather uh, uh, changes if you're using it outside. Um, but beyond that, you know, I really think they should just have worked on Wi-Fi 7 and, you know, it, at the time, instead of Wi-Fi 6, what just waste time? Just just do Wi-Fi 7 and uh, you, <laughs> actually, you know what? They should scrap 7 and just start working on 8 now. <laughs> it, I don't understand why they, they are being so inefficient. It's yeah, right. Why, why are you working on incremental? Just give us the best possible Wi-Fi right now. Yes. Why not? Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm very excited about Wi-Fi 6 because uh, I use a lot of devices, as I think more and more people do uh, at once. And and under, you know, 802.11ax, uh, the previous Wi-Fi, I guess it's Wi-Fi 5 now retroactively, um, it, it can get clogged if you have too many things trying to communicate at once. So Wi-Fi 6 is going to alleviate that. Wi-Fi 7 is going to alleviate that even more. That whole thing you talked about with sending data on multiple frequencies at the same time, uh, taking advantage of antennas, even if they're not on the same device, that's that's all going to help latency. So yeah, Patrick, like you say, in the home, 
uh, or in a, you know, a fixed location versus out and about that's, we're talking, we're talking about a, a, a different kind of thing than say 5g, uh, this, this could really just mm -hmm. end up replacing wired, which as a long time wired believer, I'm wired right now because I fear Wi-Fi. That's it's <laughs> difficult for me. to. That's say. the old people in us, uh, yeah. feeling that way, but certainly Wi-Fi six seems like one of the biggest jumps we've had in wireless, uh, technology in, in a while. Um, the other ones were cool as well, but six does a lot. Mozilla launched Firefox 69. Why not 70? Uh, well, actually, 70 is coming soon. Uh, launched Firefox 69 for Windows, Mac, Linux, and Android Monday. It includes the enhanced tracking protection on by default now. Uh, so that'll block your third-party tracking cookies, your fingerprinting, uh, your crypto mining, among other things, by default. When you uh, install a new Firefox, it's just there. I'll also prompt you when you install Firefox 69. 69 also improves performance on Windows 10, uh, gives you better battery life on Mac OS, and it will ask for permission before running Flash, which is part of the eventual retirement of Flash from use in Firefox in 2020. Firefox 69 for desktops available for download on firefox.com. Existing users can upgrade automatically and Firefox for Android rolling out slowly to Google Play users. And of course, as I mentioned, Firefox 70 coming in mid-October. Let me ask a really dumb question. Uh, to just crypto mining, off uh, on by default um, to block it on mm -hmm. by default yeah. would i ever there would there ever be an instance where i say i'd like it off <laughs> i'd like people to crypto mine in the background of my <laughs> firefox instance i did that's a great question anybody <laughs> who's like no 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 i want drive-by websites to mine coins because i want to support them uh by letting them mine coins on my machine well uh, you're, 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 joking. Show you're, you're joking but there might be an instance where this is actually the case and uh, instance, some... which you can then go and whitelist versus having crypto mining blocked by default, right? Mm. right? Yeah, mm. yeah. I'm not saying, oh, it should just be blocked always. I'm just wondering in what circumstance would I want the option? Like just let them all crypto mine, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a good mood today. Make some money, guys. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk more about standards and communication and wired this time the usb implementers forum announced the completion of the technical spec for usb 4 the successor to usb 3.2 that means companies can start building projects that use it devices with usb 4 are expected to arrive in late 2020 usb 4 will be capable of speeds up to 40 gigabits per second partly <clears throat> by incorporating intel's thunderbolt 3 USB 4 devices are also required to include USB power delivery, also called USB PD. That should help reduce the confusion over USB C cables and devices. And USB 4 cables will be passive up to 0.8 meters, though active cables will be an option. An option. Uh, USB 4 will be backwards compatible with older USB standards, and it will use the USB C style port. Oh, this is going to solve so many things. It's not perfect. It's not going to solve every single problem you have with USB, but the big cable confusion that you have now with like, wait, that's a Thunderbolt cable, not a USB-C, not a USB cable. Oh, wait, this USB cable has has uh, a little power thing in it, but this one doesn't. I thought uh, why, that's why it's not charging. Uh, that eventually goes away with USB 4 saying everything should support power delivery. Uh, everything can support Thunderbolt 3, although it doesn't have to, so there might still be some confusion in there, but it's just part of the spec now. Uh, y your your cables will be passive uh, at just shy of a meter, so you'll know if you're like, oh, I bought an extra long cable, that's going to have some electronics in it. Uh, that makes them less hackable if they're passive. Uh, USB 4 backwards compatible means that your dongles and everything still work, and uh, it's just, I, I find little not to love about this particular spec upgrade, and I welcome it coming into my life in 2020. Well, the confusion bar was pretty low. So, <laughs> you know, yes, we are, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, I, I, USB is, I mean, I, I have a desk full of dongles just under me now, and I've just gotten used to it because yes, this is a, an issue. I, I, and I still manage to rummage around being like, where is that one that I knew worked? Cause this one doesn't work uh, yeah. for all my various devices that are plugged and unplugged on the daily. But, but yeah, it's, it, the less confusion, the better. I have to admit uh, for all the doom and, and um, naysayers or doom callers, 
I haven't had issues with USB-C. Um, and I was, I'm very afraid every time I buy a cable, but uh, there are people whose lives have not been made more complicated by USB-C. And as I say this, I know that tomorrow I'm going to have it. You'll, you'll run into that situation. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. only run into it like once or twice. If you're a professional reviewer, I think this is a bigger deal because you have so many cables in your life mm -hmm. and, it's hard, and it is really hard to tell them apart by, by viewing them. Uh, so I, I think for most people, it's not as big of a deal, but this is definitely going to help make it, make it simple. And it's going to allow for USB-C hubs now. Uh, so, so that you can just, if you only have one USB-C, you can easily have USB-C multiple outlets instead of going to USB-A for your hubs. So this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased. The New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or MTA, tells the Wall Street Journal it's considering a public service announcement asking commuters not to take their AirPods on or off when entering or exiting mm -hmm. train cars. You know, you're commuting, you're in a hurry, it's busy, someone jostles you. What do you think happens? The number of lost earbuds rose significantly starting in March with the new version of AirPods and retrieval efforts causing delays. The journal says on a recent Thursday, MTA maintenance received received 18 requests to fetch lost items that fell onto the tracks. Six were AirPods. Workers used a eight foot pole with two rubber cups on the end to grab small objects like AirPods. Although some people wanted to do it themselves with one passenger using a broom and some duct tape. Very <laughs> MacGyver of you. Also very right. dangerous. I mean, it's not news like, like Nick with a C is saying in our chat room. News, small thing, easily lost. It's not news that it's easily lost. It's that the number of them uh, yeah. is, is increasing so much. So to the point where they're thinking, you know what, we need to have an announcement that tells people, not that the announcement's really going to do that much good because they're probably just falling out when people are sweaty and running for the train or whatever. But, sure. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And, and I don't know, it could encourage on... people to pay attention. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I have wireless, uh, earbuds. They're not AirPods. Because I've been told, as somebody who's historically any of Apple's uh, uh, wireless or or wired headphones just don't fit in my ears, I've been told, well, neither will the AirPods. But my jobbers fit real nice. But I have to assume that this is a widespread problem with anything wireless in people's ears. I think many of the wireless uh, air, ear, not the AirPods, but the ear phones mm -hmm. um, fit better. Honestly, I love my AirPods. I use them every day, really love them. But they they are very Apple-like in that, as you said, if they don't fit you and they slide very easily. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the used to slipping ratio is higher on AirPods than the, than it is in other. That would be uh, interesting to find things. out. Like they call them AirPods, but I, I suspect it's a little bit generically. Like how many of these are AirPods? I would I would suspect it's the vast majority of them, and how many of them are other mm -hmm. other brands? Um, it's an easy solution, Patrick. Just get ears like mine, and then they'll fit perfectly. <laughs> or apply that. duct tape over them <laughs> while commuting, like that smart person on MTA did the other day to get their uh, right. AirPod back with the broom. You're, right. you're both giving me a lot to think about. Uh, <laughs> I will take it under advisement. I can't wait to hear the announcement that is. AirPods may fall off the ears. Sort of play a piece of camera when I don't know. And next station, next one of those fall off. Wow, you sound just like him. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Researchers at Facebook are developing a virtual assistant to help Minecraft players. Now, really, this is to help develop AI. If you're like, well, these lazy Minecraft players, they can't be bothered <laughs> to play the game themselves. It's like, well, okay, that's not really the point. Uh, players type in requests in natural language to an in-game avatar, and then the assistant can carry out requests, like build a tower 15 blocks high with a smiley at the top, stuff like that. Uh, it's to see if you can get an assistant that can understand these sort of vague requests. Uh, as you know, if you have a voice speaker in your house, you have to know how to ask it things, right? And so what they're trying to do in Minecraft is carry out uh, sort of like natural language requests where you don't have to know how to ask it how to do something. And the researchers liked using Minecraft for this because of the simplicity. And, and here's a quote, Instead of superhuman performance on a single difficult task, like playing Go or something, we are interested in competency across a large number of simpler tasks specified perhaps poorly 
by humans. The developers are designing the assistant to learn from mistakes and get better as it's used, something that's often referred to as unsupervised learning, which is a big deal in machine learning. An early version of the assistant is available on GitHub if you wanted to play with it in your own Minecraft installation. Patrick, what do you think of this idea of games being a training ground for AI? I think it's absolutely fascinating. And the um, task that the tasks that they are setting these assistants on seem like something that is what we are, we should be uh, aiming towards if we want to have actually useful uh, virtual assistants, right? Because I never really thought of it until they actually said it, but do we need a computer to beat everyone at chess or to be superhumanly good at Go? Or, well, maybe we do, but we would probably get a better use out of a, an assistant that can understand me when I'm asking for coffee, right? And the really interesting thing about the uh, gaming environment is that it is a simpler rule set than the other options we would have, which are the real world reality. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's kind of training wheels for artificial intelligence to perform complex, uh, complexly expressed tasks without having the amount of variables that would maybe make it impossible uh, if it wasn't a, a kind of a sandbox type environment. Yeah, I think the reason I think the reason Go and chess were attractive it was can we get an algorithm to understand the complexity of something? It's simple rules, but it's a complex behavior. Having to project chess moves and go go moves uh, is is a complex behavior, but it's defined enough that we can do it. With Minecraft, it's it's like they're they're saying, okay, what if we have simple things for them to do? but it's wide open how they're requested. So the complexity that they're trying to master isn't the playing of the game. The complexity is understanding humans. And so they want an arena that's got simpler, a simpler situation than, than chess or go, which again, it's all about like, what can we make the, the program do? I don't know how simple uh, the tasks and requests are, though. Certainly, it seems to us with human brains easier to do those than to play Go or chess. And I wonder if the uh, quest for having uh, AIs that are better at those kind of extreme intellectual activities isn't a byproduct of us thinking they are the pinnacle of mm. intelligence just because they're really difficult for us. Um, but I don't think that if you can ask an AI, and we don't know exactly how well it's doing in Minecraft, but if you can ask it to do anything that is possible in Minecraft, it seems to me like a really, really complex uh, thing for an artificial intelligence to, me, to, to achieve. If I can actually ask a, a program to do something in Minecraft, and it will do it with a reasonable rate of success, no matter what it is, I don't know if this is less impressive than a, an, an AI winning at Go. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right. It's it's impressive in a different way. Uh, one of the things that the the researchers said in one of the interviews I read was Minecraft has a large number, an impressively large number of things you can do, but there's a much smaller subset of what people will practically want to do in the game. And that's the simplicity is like, we we can we can make sure that the algorithm knows how to move a block around and put mm -hmm. a block on another one. The complexity, like you say, comes from when a human says, well, I want you to do this. And it's a much more complex version of these, these simple things that the machine knows how to do. And that's where, like you say, it becomes really impressive because if it can understand the vagaries of our request, like make a big tower with a exactly, plant on yeah. it, you know, being able to understand that is impressive. And that's what they and, want to do. And using video games as, as what we were saying, uh, uh, simpler versions of situations or environments is, is really interesting. Uh, now I want them to train these AIs. There are a couple of games that would be interesting. I'm sure listeners could come up with their uh, suggestions for games that should be uh, trained 
some of them we shouldn't like you know uh first person shooters like doom or modern warfare maybe not uh, but things like job simulator or vacation simulator and teach them how to do these things actually wait a second i hope there isn't a podcast simulator that they right. would be trained job in job simulator but, eventually becomes not simulator and then just right right your job. Like, it, this is a terrible idea. Again, <laughs> Facebook is is doing things that they shouldn't be. Let's <laughs> stop it right now. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, who participates in our subreddit, Better Than Any Simulator Would Ever Be. You can True. submit stories like a real human and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. And now let's join in with Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler. He's got some insight on how blockchain is removing confusion between hotels and some travel management companies. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. Blockchain has been an important keyword in tech stories, even being overused on stories that don't have a lot to do with it. But one thing in the travel space that actually does make sense is a use of blockchain that's being done by Travelport, working with IBM and three hotel chains that is using blockchain to reconcile commissions that hotels pay travel management companies. And so the idea being that there would be information on this blockchain registry in terms of who booked what through who that would be visible by all and would be auditable. And so therefore it would make people feel better that they're getting paid what they should be paid, just what blockchain should do. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Yeah, I think we're going to see more of those those kinds of uses of blockchain, and hopefully that brings down my hotel rates. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Mike in Dusty Riyadh wrote in about our conversation last week about Windows machines being in tablet mode. He says, I'm actually using a Windows 10 laptop in tablet mode while listening to this conversation. Mike says, I'm flat on my back due to a back injury, and I wanted to monitor Twitter for work. Being able to read in portrait mode is nice. Some of the Microsoft apps work well in this format. However, during the course of drafting this email, I've switched keyboards three times, due in part to my screen being too big to type comfortably, and Gmail putting the compose window in the bottom third of the window and not adjusting for an on-screen keyboard. This brings me to the biggest flaw in Windows as a tablet, the lack of software or hardware support for Windows in tablet mode. While I use my computer in laptop mode 90% of the time, I find it helpful in tablet mode for note-taking or reading or drafting on the fly, cramped in the back of a car, or flying in coach. Hmm. Good insight from someone actually using it and having to use it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and then Gary wrote in and said, a few weeks ago, you were talking about Lowcast. Uh, Lowcast is the nonprofit effort to bring you your local channels in your local market, streaming over the internet. Uh, Gary said, I'd never heard of that before, so I checked it out. What a great service. I like football, but don't have cable or satellite, so I was going to shell out money to YouTube TV, Sling, or one of the other providers so I could watch games, but with Lowcast, I don't have to. Since you saved a bit of money, I decided I should thank in the form of Patreon. I just signed up and I'm happy to support independent journalism instead of paying money to large corporations. Thank you, Gary. Yay. Uh, I, I, and I hope Locast wins their court fight, which was the story we were talking about. So we'll keep you updated on that as well. Very cool. Everybody wins. Uh, you know who else is a winner? One Patrick Beja. I'll tell you what. Patrick, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Uh, well, I, we will be recording a new MVGB very soon where we talk about games uh, with our good friend Scott Johnson. But uh, if you can't wait to hear stuff from me, you could either go to Le Rendez-vous Tech if you speak French and want to hear tech news every week, or if you speak English, go check out the Phileas Club, of which we recorded, uh, recorded a new episode last week. Uh, we discuss news with people from different countries in the world and confront opinions in a respectful and friendly manner that is available at frenchspin.com. If you want the spelling of that show, it's Phileas, like Phileas Fog of Fog around the world in any days. Frenchspin.com. I Frenchbin.com. Go check it out, folks. Uh, also, we're thinking of changing our Patreon rewards. Uh, it wouldn't change anything for current patrons so much, but we came up with a proposal and we want you to look it over. So let us know if there's anything you just can't live with. You can find the proposed Patreon reward changes at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We welcome it. Keep it coming. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson as our guest. Talk to you then. 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>